Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Global Issues on Al Hikmat TV 24 7 online. It is indeed an honor, privilege, and pleasure to have with us on this show Dr. Ram Saroop, who is the Chief Executive Officer for the Guyana Office for Investment. Welcome to the show, Dr. Ram Saroop. Pleasure. Good. So for those of you who are listening worldwide, Dr. Ram Saroop is a well-known uh, international personality. His bio is phenomenal and we'll talk to him a little bit about his international connections and his connection with the U.S. Army, if I'm correct, and yes. all... Huh? Air Force. The Air Force, sorry, that was it. The Air Force, that is more interesting. And all his other um, involvement in other international projects and projects in Guyana. But presently, he's that special selected person in charge of investment in Guyana and what Guyana does, what is the future for 2021 to 2025, and the whole nine yards. I think we may have to hear a little bit about oil and gold from him there in Guyana and the services and the kind of things that his, uh, his management and administration right now under the presidency of Dr. His Excellency Dr. Irfan Ali. Fens, the single largest specialty retailer of residential and office furniture, consumer electronics, home appliances, and household items in Trinidad and Tobago. At Fens, we offer a large selection of high-quality products, honest and reliable service. We are passionate about serving you, and we're proud of the standard of excellence upheld by our knowledgeable staff, friendly delivery teams, and dedicated customer care associates. Visit Fens first, your friendly furniture appliance and electronic dealer since 1960. For all of your forwarding and freight shipping needs, we at Trend Forwarding International are committed to product delivery. At Trend Forwarding, we have the much needed experience, professionalism and due diligence in freight forwarding, shipping and cargoes. We deliver with timeliness and precision. You can reach out to us at our Caribbean office in Trinidad and Tobago, telephone number 868-624-6250 or our Florida USA office at 305-887-9750. So once more, Dr. Ramsar, welcome to the show. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to have you with us. And maybe you can share with our viewers a little bit about um, all the excitement in this new year with your position and what is your vision, what you hope to achieve, what the government hopes to achieve, etc. President, in his uh, 2021 speech on New Year's, uh, Old Year's Night, uh, for New Year's to 2021, said that Guyana is about to leapfrog uh, in the economic uh, environment. Uh, 2021, it's our it's our stepping stone. He calls for unity among our people, a unity in holding hands to develop our country together. Uh, we have an exciting uh, period ahead of us, as he described. His economic aggressive uh, economic agenda is very aggressive. He talked a lot about our modernization policies and our modernization of our infrastructure. He has described, you know, the growth uh, development uh, sectors that we will focus on over the next few years. And so, as we look at Guyana, Guyana is the number one destination of investment. It's the de de number one destination for Guyanese around the world, investors around the world to pay very close attention in what we plan to achieve over the next few years. It's an exciting time in Guyana. And uh, once these economic uh, programs uh, uh, are started, for example, the president and the president of Guyana, Dr. Van Ali and the president of Suriname, a signed agreement to build the connection bridge between Suriname and Guyana. That opens a, a new trade, a quicker trade uh, environment between the two countries. We have outlined the establishment of the road to Brazil that will start hopefully this year that connects the fourth largest economy in the world to Guyana. Uh, with that road, we are looking at uh, building a deep water harbor 
um, that will allow transport economics to be much more prevalent uh, in this region. Uh, we're looking at, at expanding 2,000 miles of roads within Guyana. Guyana is 83,000 square miles, the size of Great Britain. You know, we've got less than a million people, but we have the resources that can see the expansion rapidly in development. So as our president talks about the investment opportunities in Guyana, we have seen a, uh, a rush to look at where investors fit both locally and internationally. And I am excited to be part of a uh, parcel of this position in order to uh, see Guyana develop to where we know Guyana will be the, the region and be a, a strong force in South America and the world uh, in the next five years. So seeing that um, you have all this opening for investment there in Guyana, and because we have a lot of viewers worldwide, India, South Africa, all over the world, and the East, the Far East, the Arab world, etc., could you kind of be a little more specific now? Like, what are some of the areas that um, people from the Middle East, uh, the Arab world, or the Indo-Pak world might be interested in and might benefit more if they would look into those areas of investment in Guyana? Well, there, we know the oil industry, Guyana, you know, and the reserves right now, 9 billion barrels of oil, and that's growing exponentially in the next few years. We're in the top 20 of oil producing countries. And, uh, you know, it's about to explode even with the other blocks that have not even been explored yet. And so on the oil industry, it's still a long way to go. The downstream and upstream industries of the oil is still there available. But we're concentrating on our own sectors. Our agriculture sector is probably the largest, most exciting sector outside of oil and gas that Guyana will focus on uh, this year. The expansion of our poultry industry. We you know, for example, the Arab world, you talk about the Arab world, are interested in halal meat. Yes. And, you know, Guyana has the capacity to, for investments to come in and do this on a large scale. We have large scale mass lands available to plant soya beans and corn for the stock feeds. Uh, we are resuscitating the sugar industry, not in the same way, but diversifying it in a way that it shows value added to what you do with sugar. We yes. know that, for example, in, in India, you mentioned India, that they're big into medical tourism. But Guyana is five hours, four hours from the United States. We are you know, quicker in terms of looking at medical tourism opportunities right here in Guyana, looking at having the right infrastructure, the right technical skills to embark on those projects. And I suppose, I, I suppose yeah. that the cost might be much more beneficial for these investors to invest in Guyana because uh, you know that Arabs, there are many Arab investors who have invested in the poultry area in Brazil, your neighbor, yes. right in Brazil. They have a lot of investment there in the poultry um, area, but fantastic. Yes, so as you were saying, we need to let the world know that Guyana might be much more economical in the investment with a lot more profit and benefits to international in investors. Yes, and it's key to where the puck is going to be, as when uh, Gretzky said, the hockey player, you know, as we bring energy costs, we're starting the gas to shore pipeline this year. Right. Energy costs in Guyana is going to come down by 50%. We're resuscitating the hydro project, the Mali Falls project. We're looking at wind power and solar power. So as energy cost comes down and you get the deep water harbor done, the Brazil connection, uh, the Suriname connection, then again, getting your goods out of Guyana will be much more economical. The Caribbean, for example, you know, Trinidad and Barbados and the rest of the world, and rest of the Caribbean imports close to 10 billion US dollars worth of food every year prior to COVID-19, I'm not sure what the, the new number is, but Guyana can feed the Caribbean. So we have, that's where the agriculture sector, again, I say it's the most exciting sector that we can look at, because if you can capture in the Caribbean alone, forget North American, European, part of that $10 billion uh, opportunity, then your goods don't have to go far. You know, you've got to, add the science to, to the agriculture and the technology to the agriculture, but that is about to grow. So 
The president uh, infrastructure modernization plan for Guyana and the, the aggressive way in which it is being implemented will allow investors want to you know feel safe in, in a stable political environment. The fight for democracy that proves to the world that we will stand up to ensure democracy never fails in Guyana. Thanks to people in Guyana, the international community and the diaspora around the world has ensured that democracy uh, passed the test and we have a democratically elected government. We are looking, you know, our investment tax policy is very, very friendly to investors. You can actually repatriate all your profits with no penalty. We've got a, you know, the, the commercial court system. So we've got a very educated population. So we are an exciting destination. I think as, as investors pay attention to the, the process and what can happen with their investments coming together, we want also to ensure that investors know we have a lot of indigenous companies again that have done extremely well. So you're looking for partners with our local uh, content providers. You're looking at, at areas of joint ventures their wide opportunity. The private sector is willing and ready for investors coming from around the world to partner with them to look at how we expand our own industries. That is phenomenal. So the investments, uh, opportunities are very wide and the doors are very widely open for people to invest. That is interesting, very, very fantastic. So Dr. Ramsrup, we have already been speaking for 10 minutes. Could you imagine that 10 minutes have gone? So we're going to go on a short break. And when we come back, we would like you to share a little bit about your background, a little bit of some of the things you have done and your achievements and accomplishments, which, of course, led you to the position that you are in today in this phenomenal, unique position as a chief executive officer for the Guyana Office for Investment. And um, we may probably discuss a little bit about some political areas of the future of Guyana under the leadership of Dr. Irfan Ali. So when we come back, we'll continue that conversation. And for our viewers out there, we have been speaking to Dr. Ram Saroop, the Chief Executive Officer for the Guyana Office for Investment. Stay tuned. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with him from the political aspect of things in Guyana, the future and the investment, the investment area of opportunity that exists. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Allah gives hikmat, wisdom, to whomsoever He wills. And whomsoever is given wisdom is certainly given a lot of good. Only the people of understanding will benefit from the reminder. Tune in to Al Hikmat TV for kutbahs, lectures, and Islamic reminders. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In the Quran, in chapter 5, verse 67, Allah tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Ya ayyuhar Rasul Ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik Wa illam taf'al Fa ma balagta risalatuhu Very deep Allah tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam To spread the message of the Quran And he told the Prophet And if you do not spread the message You did not fulfill the mission of the messenger So you and I are followers of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if we can afford one Quran, help us join in distributing the Quran. So if you can't afford one Quran, do it. Three dollars, ten Quran, thirty dollars, a hundred Quran, three hundred dollars. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Global Issues on Al Hikmat TV 24-7 online. Once more, it is a pleasure to have with us on the show today, Dr. Ram Saroop, who is the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer for the Guyana Office for Investment. For those of you who have just tuned in, he is a phenomenal person with a one interesting background. And today he is in this um, powerful position here in the government of Guyana. So welcome back to the show, Dr. Ramsar. So as we were talking on investment, etc., before we continue a little bit on the political aspect and what you see as the future of the political 
situation in Guyana under the leadership of Dr. Irfan Ali. Tell us a little bit for the benefit of our viewers worldwide, because as you know, we got viewers all over the world. Uh, what are some of the, the, the achievements and the places and the things you have done and been in the past? Well, I mean, it's uh, out there in the public domain, but you know, I spent uh, my first almost 18 years in Guyana, grew up, um, you know, in, in rural areas, uh, learned a lot uh, from, you know, what what Guyana can uh, potentially achieve. We grew up under a dictatorship environment in my time, and I vowed never to um, allow or be part of any dictatorship system ever again. I moved to the United States with my parents at that age and joined the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the reason for the U.S. military is, is fighting for freedom around the world. I got a chance to go to um, uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, to fight for the liberation of Kuwait um, when they were taken over by dictatorship. So I know what it's like to fight for freedom and democracy. And, and uh, as I mentioned in the start of the program, seeing what Guyana stagnant economy five years uh, in the making up to uh, March 2nd election, uh, we had a standard economy from March 2nd to August 2nd. We had a, uh, uh, an organization, a political party that stifled our nation and tried to hold on to power. And a lot of us across the and around the world fought to ensure democracy prevails. And, you know, so my background, I think, helped in that. I've been able to travel the world, 70 plus countries. I've seen what development is like. I see what poverty is like. And I want to see Guyana. Uh, along with all of us. And I was so happy that the president asked me to be part of this position because I believe with his vision and his knowledge and his ability to lead and measure our development, uh, a lot of us can be part of that with him and to ensure that we implement the plan necessary. And ultimately, as he said, is for all of us in Guyana, for the creation of wealth for Guyanese, to ensure all of us are employed. We have a, a healthy nation. We have a nation unified among all political sides that he wants to govern for all of Guyana. And any one of us living in Guyana right now is excited about that we have a president that believes in all of Guyana and believes in every citizen and is doing what it takes to make each of us feel part of nation building. And, and that's, I believe, is, is the most exciting journey we can have. Well, that is wonderful. That is really, really unique. And a man with your kind of travel and experience worldwide, the president, Dr. Irfan Ali, could not have chosen someone better than you to lead this area in the government and for the betterment of the people in Guyana. So um, what else do you see as some of the future vision in the political arena and I, I maybe at this point you must give my salams when you speak to dr Irfan ali the president give us give him our salam alaikum and maybe one day we can have him on the show to share some of his views and perspective but from your point of view what do you see as some of the major political changes or uh, a future of Guyana to that dictatorial kind of system that you guys had there in the past? Well, we are, we're definitely, as the president says, working on a unified approach to governance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we believe in transparency and accountability, democracy. His, all his policies uh, from August 2nd outlines that. We have an opposition that continues to stagnate our, our country in, the, in ways that they should not be doing. Uh, hopefully that they come to their senses, recognize that we have a legitimate government. We have a government democratically elected and we have a, a president that is a president for all of Guyana. So I see us continue to build on democracy, build on the pillars of democracy, build on economic foundation, pillars and springboards that is needed in order for Guyanese to see that our country is truly beneficial to all of us. And I, say, I believe on, on the president's side, he has um, outlined that charter and he's implementing that charter and, and it is well um, taken by the, the people of Guyana that, that he will manage our country to our benefit. And, and as I travel around our nation and as I listen to people and I've seen our president interact with our citizens, I can tell you it's a new atmosphere. 
It's a, it's a calmer atmosphere. It's an exciting atmosphere. And that's why I feel from an investment standpoint, investors coming in in the Ghana can understand and, and be assured that we want to be part of that group. We want to help work with them. We want them to benefit from it as much as we will benefit from it. And it's, it's a win-win situation. The private sector is the engine of growth and we know foreign direct, foreign direct investments and local direct investments is critical for our future development as a nation. Uh, the Exxon's of the world has proven that they are coming, they've taken the risks. A lot of other com companies are coming in at new ventures that, you know, Ghana is still an emerging market, it's still a growing market, it's the fastest growing economy in the, in the world per capita in 2020. We expect that growth to continue. Is the place to be. And I, I'm excited that on the political, the economic, and, and the, the social side, we're bridging that interaction between the three and ultimately, you can see that integrated approach benefit all of Guyana. So, seeing that you got a lot of um, Guyanese living in Europe, in Canada, of course, in America, North America, in Europe, etc., how do you see the connection and how do you intend to get them to invest in Guyana and get other people? from other countries, as I said, wherever, Arabia, India, how, how, how do you plan on connecting with these people to motivate them so that they can invest in Guyana? Well, as you see, just on our investment portfolios over the next four or five years, the growth is going to be exponential. We going to need more people coming back to Guyana. The president has outlined a diaspora policy where he is putting an attractive incentives for the diaspora to come back home. We need that knowledge transfer. We need the integration among all our people around the world, Guyanese around the world. I tell a lot of Guyanese that, you know, a lot of them left under the dictatorship rule in the 80s, mm -hmm. 70s and 80s. A lot of their kids have grown up uh, outside of Guyana. And a lot of them had an uh, impression of what Guyana should look like. Right. And they all dream of what Guyana should be. Guyana is their first love. They want to come back to Guyana. It's their first love. Now they get a chance under the leadership of Dr. Air Finance, under the economic boom that we're seeing, they now get a chance to do it together, to do it with all of us. So the benefit of returning to Ghana, I returned to Ghana, you know, almost, you know, close to 15, 16 years ago, and I've never regretted that opportunity to come back and learn and be part of the growth. And then if I had to, somebody asked me, you know, years ago, I would tell folks I want to retire in Florida. Right now, I have no desire to retire in Florida. This is the place. If I can own, be on, on the water, I can see the growth in Guyana, I can see our people benefit. This is where we all need to be. And, and I am excited to see Guyanese around the world paying interest in Guyana. We have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that are, are put out the diaspora policy, and they will continue to expand that diaspora policy for us to come back home. So you see a lot of um, a lot of benefits by them coming, investing, living, and they can, they can have properties in America and still have properties in Guyana and benefit yes. from the two worlds, right? Yes, and the workforce, what, what we have to pay attention to, whether it's in Trinidad or in Barbados, our workforce and the, the growth that we're going at, the, the salary range is starting to climb. Property ranges are starting to climb. So on a personal side, you will see maybe comparable salaries very soon mm. in many, many sectors. You're going to see property value probably even more greater than, than in North America and other parts of the Caribbean. So now is the time, the earlier you, you, you get into the process, the better off you can do in the long run. It's that, a good return on investment. That makes a lot of sense because when more people start coming and the investment starts growing, things are going to get much more expensive. So they might as well get into it right now and benefit from all the opportunities and benefit. Fantastic. Yeah, the president has committed, you know, a couple of areas I know the diaspora is very interested in is uh, you know upgrading our healthcare system we the president has outlined a uh, significant improvement in our healthcare system talking about a specialty hospital we're looking at eye specialty hospital other specialty care in health 
healthcare. We are embarking on regional healthcare opportunities in regional hospitals across the country. You know, we're aggressively working with the security sector in, in ensuring a, a more safer environment, a stronger community environment. So those components tied together with economics under the president's vision will see what you may be looking for, both from an investment perspective and from a, a diaspora perspective and moving back to Ghana. And then where do you fit? You know, for example, simple things like a large laundry service may sound not sexy. It may not sound like a big operation. But those are areas where, you know, new opportunities expand as a country grows. You know, what are things that you have seen in a developed world come about? And, you know, if you go to certain areas in Florida, for example, you know, uh, years ago it was just blank land. Yeah. Now you look at it, it it's, it's, you've got malls going up, you've got housing schemes going up. There's no difference in Guyana. We're about to, you know, Ronnie Sarwan, our great cricketer, is about to open one of the largest malls in Guyana shortly. When you look at the mall, you would think there's no difference than a U.S. mall, right? So we're expanding growth on, on, on many different sectors. And, and you know, you would not miss things that you, you may think you're going to miss in, in, the, in the North America or in Europe or in Toronto. I think you've got to help build that in Guyana. And I'm excited. I can, I can sell it. But I've lived it and I know that I, I have benefited from it and I want to see others come and be benefited and be part of that road process with us. You are totally correct, Dr. Ramsarup. You know, as you talk about Guyana there, I remember when I was 16 years of age, the very first country that I ever traveled to was Guyana. And Guyana is really at the bottom of my heart because I always remember Guyana as my first international uh, trip and the food and the place and the people so loving and so nice. I think this could not have been a better opportunity for people from the international world to come back and to invest and benefit from all the bounties and the benefits that you all have to offer there in Cayenne now. So we have already been talking for 10 minutes in this second segment. Uh, you got the last word. Tell us what you would like to say in a couple of seconds as we conclude the show, Dr. Ramsar. Again, is open for investments. We look forward and welcome all uh, investors coming into Ghana or, or companies, indigenous companies are looking forward to working with the foreign companies coming in. Our people are looking forward to integration with the diaspora back again. We're looking forward to, to our president implementing his vision and his ec aggressive economic agenda. And we all look forward to the fact that we are part of it. We can see Guyana grow together. And, uh, you know, and we will, will ensure that we do it with accountability, transparency, and uh, ensure that, that the government delivers to our people. And ultimately, as the president said, creation of wealth for Guyanese. And he plans to make sure that happens very quickly and will benefit to our nation and around the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramsarup. It has really been a pleasure talking to you, and I'm sure the viewers, after looking at this show, you may have a couple thousands of people there willing to put their money down where they can get more benefit in investments there in Guyana under your leadership and under the leadership of the Honorable President, Dr. Erfan Ali. So once more, I know you're a busy man with a busy schedule, but we thank you again very much for taking the time to be with us on this show. So to our viewers worldwide there has been a pleasure, a blessing and an opportunity to speak to Dr. Ramsarup, the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer for the Guyana Office for Investment. And those of you who are thinking and pondering, this is an opportunity to make that investment in Guyana now. Contact his office. You can get things rolling and reaping in the very near future. Stay tuned for global issues on Al Hikma TV 24 7 online. We have coming up from South Africa, Catherine Constanti Dennis, a very well known, world renowned personality, humanitarian. Uh, she's considered an earth warrior, global activist, uh, leader of change, uh, South Africa's change agents. So stay tuned as we discuss and connect and discuss 
with Catherine about her humanitarian services worldwide. Insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. If you would like to dedicate copies of one of these publications as Sadaqah Jariya, continuous blessings for your parents or dear ones who have passed away, or fi sabidullah in the path of Allah, please give us a call so we can place your names on these dedicated publications. You can call us at 954-986-0158 or you can also visit us at www.alhikmat.com. Allah is the creator of different faces. Allah is the creator of all races. Allahu, 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 Allah. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Global Issues on Al Hikmat TV 24 7 online. It is indeed a pleasure to have with us on this show Global Issues issues we have Catherine from South Africa welcome to the show Catherine assalamu alaikum thank you so much for having me it's really a pleasure and for the benefit of our viewers there Catherine is a very prominent person in South Africa and world renowned she is a humanitarian she's considered an earth warrior global activist a leader of change etc etc so she has a very interesting background a lot of experience in community services and social services so stay tuned as we talk to Catherine and to get a full name it's Constanti Dinis and I hope I did that correct Catherine did I <laughs> it was almost correct <laughs> uh, Almost correct. <laughs> Almost correct, but it was perfect. So, Don't so worry. Perfect. How do you pronounce it? Constantinides. Constantinides. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I'll stay away from pronouncing that, but we'll <laughs> keep it on Catherine, okay? That's perfect. <laughs> Excellent. So what part of South Africa are you from exactly? Home is Johannesburg. I live in Johannesburg, but my work <laughs> takes me across the country, so I'm privileged to be able to, to stay in many parts of the country uh, because of the work that I do. But I always come back home where my roots are, and that is Johannesburg. I know Johannesburg is a beautiful place. I first visited Johannesburg in 1994. And wow. Yes, yes. And then I went back sometime in maybe 2005 or something to that effect. But beautiful, beautiful, beautiful country and wonderful people. Exactly. <coughs> Good. It's a really Mash special country and a very special part of the continent of Africa. So I'm very, very proud to come from South Africa. And I'm very much looking forward to COVID disappearing when we could come back and visit once more and probably join you in some of your humanitarian projects absolutely inshallah we will definitely do that we have to just push through the next couple of months and perhaps you know a, a prolonged period but it is really important because we need to be able to get through this in order to be able to find a new norm do things again the way that we we used to and to be able to connect in person because i think that the human connection can never be replaced even by the power of technology and i look forward to that time you know i i tell people sometimes that Human touch is a therapy. It has a whole different kind of therapy and healing to many problems in the world. You are so, so right. That is so beautiful and so true. That's why God created us, created us to know one another, to understand one another, to live amongst one another because that is a therapy it's a healing it removes stress and depression mm -hmm. plus one of the reason why i think a lot of people suffer stress and depression it's because they have disconnected from the human touch mm. I, I couldn't agree with you more absolutely uh, and that's why you are such a special person because you are in a profession that gives you that opportunity to keep in touch with human beings, keep in touch with people. 
No, I really, I try to do, you know, my, my work. I feel blessed and honored to do the work that I do, but I'm honestly only doing God's work. It really, really, truly is that. Good, that is superb. So tell us a little bit on what motivated you to get into all this humanitarian uh, services and I read your bio. Wow, it is such an interesting bio, all your connections with United Nations and Geneva and traveling all over the world and all these social services that you have been and that you are involved in. What has really motivated you to devote this kind of time to do these uh, human services? No, I grew up in a very humble home. Um, my family, we, we, had, we had very little, in fact, growing up. And what was really important was that I didn't know that. So growing up, I didn't know we had very little. I didn't know we came from a very, uh, you know, humble home. But I always, what I did know was that we lived a life of service. I saw my father, my mother constantly doing community service, not as something that they tried to fit into their schedule, but the way that we lived as a family. And so our family would, over a weekend, we would cook food and go to a, an orphanage, an old age home, a quadriplegic center, and we would feed people. We would sit with people. We would play games at the old age home with the old ladies. My, my, they loved my father, so they would really want us to come every weekend to play bingo with them and do small things with them, do gardening with them. And this was the way of life of our family. I did not know that this was not something that everybody did. I just thought that this was normal and this was the kind of life that people live. And so as I grew up, that became something that organically turned into my humanitarian and climate work. I, I had a base where as a young child, my father spent much time with us in our very small garden, but he taught us everything about the earth and the garden and the flowers and you know, the, the beauty of nature. And I think what was very special about that was that he gave my sister and I a responsibility not only to look after and protect our garden, but to protect the earth. And I suppose subconsciously I took that to heart and literally <laughs> decided that that's what I was going to do. And um, my work as a, humana a humanitarian and an environmentalist became something that was was my path and and would grow into the work that I have done over the past many years of my life. You know, listening to you, you sound like Princess Diana, man. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that is a great honor, wow. <laughs> yeah, I think so, because th those used to be some of her words and how much she, you know, loved uh, human services. So when I hear you say these things, wow, it is really, really interesting you're like the the princess diana of today all right <laughs> thank you i'll take that <laughs> yes you're welcome so um <laughs> you know i have heard you say assalamu alaikum and uh, alhamdulillah and everything like that how have you been connected to hafiz Kari ziyad so firstly let me say that Kari ziyad is somebody who is very dear and special to me. He is a, a true brother to me. I have had the privilege to know him and come to know him through my humanitarian work. Mm -hmm. And as a South African, uh, our, you know, our paths have crossed many times. But I've I've got a very strong connection to both the Muslim community here in South Africa, but also in other parts of the world. I work extensively in Western Sahara in North Africa, and Western Sahara is a Muslim country and nation of people, and they have become my second nation. I often say as I fight for their self-determination and their liberation and human rights, they are my people. And so the time that I spend living with them, amongst them, understanding their absolute you know, their daily life, their core, their struggle, their vision, their, their wants and needs. I have really tried to also ensure that I understand their culture, their religion, their language in order to truly, truly be able to do what they've given me the honor to do. And that is to represent them and to be a voice for them 
at international platforms, the United Nations, where I constantly lobby with them, um, them being the freedom fighters who are my brothers and sisters. But the work has been extensive. But again, it, it really does start with the roots that I have here in South Africa. And I constantly do extensive outreach work with my Muslim brothers and sisters here in South Africa. Kari Ziad Patel is one remarkable South African and his organization, Alim Dad, has done incredible, incredible work. There's also the Muslim Association of South Africa that I've worked extensively with, especially in the last period of this year, this past year, where we have tried to really drive people really rallying behind humanitarian work because in South Africa, the disparity of poverty and inequality is so huge. The amount of people who go hungry every night and because of lockdown and COVID, that has been amplified. But the Muslim Association has done incredible work and I'm very proud of the work done by my brothers and sisters within the Muslim community. Well, that is incredible to know that you uh, not only work with people all over the world, but you got that softness in your heart for Muslims and uh, Muslim communities, etc. Time just goes listening to you and hearing your background <laughs> and your kind of community and human services. W would you believe we have already been speaking for 10 minutes? I just can't no. believe that. <laughs> yes. But before we go, I'm going to have to take that little extra minute or two. When we come back, we'll get a little more in details just for the benefit of our viewers worldwide because social social media and the network nowadays is very vast, very vast. So could you just in a couple of seconds let us know a little bit more about some of the countries that you have been and some of the major activities that you have done internationally? Sure. So I've worked extensively across Africa, uh, Southeast Asia. So in Africa, I've worked in Rwanda, Zambia, Ethiopia, Algeria, Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, then going to Southeast Asia, Cambodia, the Philippines, Thailand. The Philippines has a very special place in my heart, and I've worked there for many, many years on community upliftment work, uh, really grassroots level development work, and also climate work, looking at how do we ensure a climate resilient community, especially for the island nations in the Philippines. And so that work has been something very special to me for a very long time working on water related programs and projects and waste. Waste has become something that I've become really uh, focused on championing because nobody really likes to talk about waste. However, waste is such a huge challenge within our communities. I recently, just before COVID, got to also spend some time in Azad Jamur Kashmir, and it was a really great privilege to be in Kashmir and to also understand the plight and the fight for human rights of the Kashmiri people. I've worked across the United States, um, you know, across different states, and then also in South America, in Peru, Colombia, and um, in Alaska up north, I'm trying to think of where else. The Sahara, as I've mentioned, has got a very, very special place in my heart. And then as as we look into Europe, I've had the privilege of working constantly throughout the last five years in Geneva. I've also worked in Germany, Austria, in France, uh, Italy, in Greece, London, and um, I'm sure there's a few places I'm missing, but those those ones cover the main places. I've also been privileged to do some work in Japan, but uh, you know I think the community work that I do is is such a privilege because I have the opportunity to connect with human beings from different corners of our earth, and I do what I do because I realize that my humanity lies in you, the next person. There's so much that the world would like us to think that divides us, but the beauty of who we are is our differences. But when we understand that we're so connected because of being human beings, our humanness is what makes us connect to each other. When we realize that we're able to do so much more. Well, I'm sure that those kind of international traveling and human services, that is surely what is keeping you with the blessings of God, keeping you stronger and looking younger. Uh, thank you. <laughs> you know, it keeps you stronger and younger. Definitely. I, I, I'm amazed. <laughs> You have done so much in the Philippines. I've been to the Philippines many times on a couple lecture tours, etc. Fantastic place, fantastic place. And uh, you're right, a lot of need there 
for mm -hmm. human services well Catherine when we come back after the short break we want to continue a little more on some specifics of some of these community services and human services that you have done and whatever advice you may have to our listening audience our viewers worldwide what suggestions and recommendation or motivation you may want to give to them so that a lot more people in the world can get involved in the kind of services that God has chosen you to do. So when we come back, stay tuned. And for viewers out there, we got to go on a short break, but stay tuned. When we come back, we'll continue this conversation with Catherine, a very international, well-renowned personality, a global activist and an earth warrior when it comes to humanitarian services. Stay tuned when we come back, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Allah gives hikmat, wisdom, to whomsoever He wills. And whomsoever is given wisdom is certainly given a lot of good. Only the people of understanding will benefit from the reminder. Tune in to Al Hikma TV for kutbas, lectures, and Islamic reminders. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In the Quran, in chapter 5, Verse 67, Allah tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Ya ayyuhar Rasul, Ballig ma unzila ilayka mir rabbik, wa illam taf'al, fa ma balagta risalatuhu. Very deep. Allah tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to spread the message of the Quran. And he told the Prophet, and if you do not spread the message, you did not fulfill the mission of the Messenger. So you and I are followers of the Prophet If we can afford one Quran, help us join in distributing the Quran. So if you can't afford one Quran, do it. Three dollars, ten Quran, thirty dollars, a hundred Quran, three hundred dollars. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Global Issues on Al Hikmat TV. It is indeed a pleasure again once more to have with us on this show Catherine Constanti Dennis. I got it correct this time? Yes. <laughs> okay. And for those of you who have just tuned in, Catherine is a world renowned personality, humanitarian. Uh, she's a global activist and uh, you would have heard before we went on the short break the many 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 countries that she has traveled and has done human services so not to take it away from her time I don't want to take away from her time I just want to go right back to Catherine so we can ask her of any special project that you amongst the many 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 projects in the world that you have been involved in what else would you like to let us know i know you've been recognized in many places and many by many organizations would you like to share with our viewers some of the um organizations that you have been recognized by you know the the work that i do is is so important to me and um when you're busy on the ground and you're working and your head's kind of down and and you're you're pushing to achieve the goals and the the outcomes you need to to achieve within communities and within different frameworks of programs and projects it really always comes to me as a surprise when you get certain recognition because that's not why you're doing the work that you do truly. and so I'm, I'm truly humbled by the recognition that I have had and received and um, you know it it also I think talks about uh, you know a long-term a long-term foundation of, of trust of of putting in your authentic self into the projects that you do and uh, you know it, it's really something that I'm I'm grateful for but for me it's really about putting your head down getting your hands dirty and ensuring that there's an end goal that is achieved that we're able to really have impact and we're able to connect with other human beings connect with people leave seeds of hope in in those that we get to to share moments of our lives with and perhaps they will go out and they will replicate something that connects with them in some small way and for me that's what's important so the the, the many 
wonderful recognitions I've had and the honor to be ambassador for many projects and international foundations and organizations is a wonderful thing. I will just mention perhaps two. The one is the Nelson Mandela Foundation and they each one feed one campaign. And I'm, I'm proud to be the ambassador, an ambassador for this program. And also the Earthshot Prize that was recently launched by Prince William and this is a prize that seeks to really drive uh, focus and attention on um, global and local solutions to the climate crisis that we see faced by the world over. And so to be an ambassador and to be a spokesperson for organizations such as this really is a humbling thing. Uh, there are many accolades that I'm, I'm really, truly grateful for. And, you know, people can search my name, they'd be able to find them there. But really, it is about the work that needs to be done. It's about the impact that we need to have. And we find ourselves in a time and space where the world needs love and kindness. We need goodness that we pour into the world and to the people around us now more than ever. We need light and love because I think that the world is missing these fundamental values and our societies are pained by so much that is going on around us. And it's really because we lack values and institutions of, of moral compasses where we understand that we live for the greater good and and you know we are able to only live because of um, our creator and and what work he wants us to do and sometimes we steer away from that but that truly is uh, you know what we should always work towards and and the reason we should always do the work that we're doing <laughs> again after listening to you I remember a very famous Urdu are you familiar with the language Urdu uh, uh, very briefly, but yes. Yeah, you know, there is a saying in Urdu, Ibadat se jannat milta hai, and khidmat se khuda milta hai. It means that when you do prayer and religious services, you know, like in the church, in the mosque, whatever, you get paradise. But when you do human services, you get God. You get God. Wow. Very interesting. That is beautiful. Yeah, you do that is religious beautiful. prayer services, you get paradise. And when you do the kind of human services that you do, you get God. And when you have God, you automatically got the world and you got paradise. So that is what you are all into. Ah, oh, Jazakla. That's really beautiful. I'm going to remember that. Yes, you remember that. And I'm sure that you definitely find that peace and that tranquility in your heart when you do these kind of services you know Catherine there are a lot of people who have a lot of things materialistically speaking in this world but they don't have peace they don't have mm -hmm. tranquility they don't have that peace of mind but doing the kind of things that you do I'm sure that God has surely blessed you with that peace of mind Absolutely. I think that the one thing I, I get to go to bed at night and wake up every morning and be grateful for the life that I live. I have a peace of mind knowing that I've done all that I can do. And I think that so often we, we, we sacrifice far too much for corporate, you know, to climb the corporate ladder, to be able to have fancy offices, fancy titles in, in big the big corporate world and and uh, you know in, in different spaces that we occupy but I think we forget that we need to internally our souls need to be happy we need to be at peace with ourselves we need to understand that we are only as strong as the weakest link around us and I've seen suffering I've known suffering in my own life but I've also seen it within the communities that I have entrenched myself and I've seen suffering from the smallest child or the smallest baby to the eldest in the community and the suffering of humanity is something that we must never ever turn a blind eye to it's something that we have to for me I can never walk away from the things that I have seen and I've seen those things because God has a certain path and 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 purpose for me and so I have to constantly use my platform my voice and my ability to to not only do the work but to be able to share why it's important that we all try and live a little bit bigger than only ourselves we live in silos instead we need to live in a greater capacity 
to be able to touch the lives of others. And I'm sure that's why God chose you and someone like you to do his kind of services to humanity. So you're not only an ambassador for these organizations that uh, chose you to do it, but you're an ambassador of God. You are an ambassador of God to humanity. Tell us a little bit. Tell us a little bit about that TV show or TV series that you were part of. So One Day Leader is uh, been an incredible program that for many many years I had the privilege of being a a part of, and this was a TV show run in South Africa for young South Africans to inspire leadership qualities for children. Well, not children, but young people between the age of 17 to 35, and to try and inspire a culture of leadership, a culture of ownership of their own path. And so, one day leader was went on a national tour every year looking for these young leaders who had potential qualities uh, and wanted to be a part of the show and it was a reality tv show where we gave them actual challenges that their communities faced and via this tv program we tried to use the the idea and the framework of reality tv to really address social issues in south africa it was really an incredible few years of doing this program uh, we then ultimately chose one leader at the end of the uh, the series where that one day leader won uh, you know a year of internship programs money to fund projects that they were busy with and really to address again the social challenges and social justice issues that they found in their very communities these were children that came from really grassroots level communities townships rural areas and they came from such vast backgrounds that the richness of the content of the show was something that will live with me always it was really something about how do we empower young people people who are honestly forgotten and i think in a country like ours where the challenges are so great to be able to give this platform and this show primetime television um, slots on TV in South Africa on, on the national broadcaster was something that then inspired those that couldn't be a part of the show. And years later, I, you know, from the first show, three years later, I'd walk into a community somewhere in a very, very um, far away community, away from the cities, and people would come up to me and say they always wanted to be a part of One Day Leader. They were so inspired by what we were able to achieve, what we did. They decided to take up certain issues within their communities and drive change. They asked, they started to not ask who's going to do something about a problem, but they started to ask, what am I going to do about certain challenges and problems? And so that was for us the fundamental aim. And we really achieved a lot of incredible uh, success stories that were almost spin-offs from just the TV show. But the one day leaders who were part of the show went on to really do great things. And I, I have no doubt will continue to be great leaders in our country. Well, I don't think they could have had a better person with your kind of personality uh -huh. to be a judge on that TV show. So again, <laughs> you, you would have been a phenomenal mentor for all these young leaders coming up there in South Africa. So well, may God bless you and continue to bless you for this phenomenal services that God has chosen you to do. Again, we have come to the end of the show. It's already 10 minutes on the second segment. <laughs> uh, actually, it's more than 10 minutes, but um, we, can take, we, we can take a couple of seconds. What would you like to say before we close off? I would perhaps like to encourage everyone who is watching or listening to the segment, find what it is that you're passionate about and start to do something within your own community. Do something from where you are. You don't need a corner office. You don't need a fancy title. Just do something that connects to your soul. It will not only give you the satisfaction of seeing something change, but it will give you the opportunity to really reconnect with what values you have as a human being for yourself.
I think we can all do so much. There's no man that makes a greater mistake than somebody who does nothing because they can only do a little. So I would encourage you to do just that little and change the corner that you live on. I think that that would be my message and, and my ask of everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity. If there's anything you want to ask that I haven't perhaps covered, you can find me on social media at Change Agent SA on Twitter and Instagram. And if you Google my name, you'll find me on Facebook as well. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. It has been a exactly. blessing. It has been a pleasure to have you on this show. And I'm sure that our viewers worldwide would have definitely learned a lot from your personality, your experience and your motivation. I think you are so, you are so motivating to listen to and um, may God continue to bless you and thank you. I think it would be an honor, pleasure to have you to come back on the show some other time in the future where we can discuss some project and some other programs and activities that you are involved in. So once more, a special thanks to you and to our viewers out there. Again, it has been an honor and a pleasure to have with us on Global Issues on Al Hikmat TV. Catherine, a well-known, world-renowned personality when it comes to humanitarian services. And do remember, always stay tuned to Al Hikma TV 24-7 online. Royal Bengal Trading, importer, exporter, wholesaler of Bangladeshi indo pak groceries and spices. We specialize in various authentic Indian masalas, juices, flowers, rices and spices. We offer exclusive brands as Ocean Pearl, Sean, National, Tilda, Himani, and many, many more. We're located at 36B Caroni Savannah Road, Charlieville, Shiguanas, Trinidad, and Tobago. You can call us at 473-4676 or call 476-3117. Email us at wahabdk at gmail.com.